Countless pale stars glittered in the sky, and a soft breeze caressed my cheek as I moved I-47 in closer to shore. The enemy was repairing damage done to his ships at Leyte, obviously. Even at midnight I could catch the sparkle of welding torches. A half hour later I gave the order pilots, stand by to board Chiton 3 and 4. These two giant torpedoes could only be boarded from on deck, the other pair could be reached via access tubes from the hull. Ensign Sato and Watanabe walked up to Nishina at that time. I am ready to board, each said, saluting. Both were wearing short swords and had white hachimaki tied tightly about their foreheads. I appreciate your excellent conduct and spirit while under my command, said Nishina crisply. Keep your spirit high right up to the target. I will shortly meet you in the world to come. Good luck, the three of them came to the bridge. Conditions inside the lagoon appear to be unchanged, I told them. There seems to be the same number of ships present as we saw before, and the enemy does not appear to be taking any extra precautions. I intend to follow our original plan. I hope that you men will be able to demonstrate the full power of the chitin. Sato and Watanabe shook hands with me then, saluted and hurried aft to where the weapons rested in their racks. Assisted by Nishina and the technicians, they climbed into the torpedoes. Both took one look at the sky and one deep breath of fresh air before the hatches closed over them. It was 1am, we were about five miles from our launch point. I dived I-47 and moved at slow speed. At 3am I ordered the two remaining pilots to board their chiton. Nishina congratulated my crew and myself on having gotten so close to the enemy without detection and thanked us for our help. Please do not endanger your ship in observing our results, sir, he said. Chiton operations should always remain a mystery to the enemy if possible. He hoped that we would leave the area without being detected, so that the Americans would have difficulty puzzling out the source of this attack. Nishina then headed for his access tube in the main engine room, and Fukuda for his in the machinery compartment. Both shook hands with I-47 crewmen along the way. Nishina had Kuroki's ashes in an urn with him. My navigator manned a telephone in the conning tower that connected him with all four pilots. Are you lonesome up there? he asked Sato and Watanabe. You have been waiting a long time. Both had by then been confined in their narrow chambers for two hours. Not I, said Sato. I have been singing. Watanabe was equally nonchalant. That ice cream you served us at dinner was very good, he said calmly. Thank you very much for your thoughtfulness, I have often thought over the years, of how calm those young men, the flower of Japan's manhood, were. Death was only minutes away, but they were acting as though everything was routine. At 4am, I-47 was off Losau Island, Ulithi Atoll, by running directly northeast. All four chiton would pass between Lolang and Mangejang, two small islets, and be in the deep anchorage water. I-36 was about seven miles northeast of Yuno, off Gilap Island. Her chiton had a straight run west through Mugia Channel, the broad eastern opening to Ulithi Lagoon. I-47 picked up a destroyer on its sound gear about 3.30am, but he moved away without attacking us. A rapid series of orders poured from our navigator as the chiton pilots set their compasses to line up with I-47s and rechecked their depth settings against ours. Stand by, number one. I ordered, then asked Nishina if he wanted to speak any final words. Yes, he said, my thanks to all, good luck to those chiton that follow me, and good luck to I-47, go, I ordered. It was 4.15am. The third band had already been loosed, now the fourth was let go. As I heard Nishina's engine start, I moved to my periscope. A line of white bubbles obscured my view. It was the wake from chiton 1. Nishina was away. Next was Caton 3 with Ensign Sato. He was aft on the starboard side of the deck. I will try to strike one of those large ships for you, Captain were his last words. Ensign Watanabe, aft on the port side, had Caton 4. Long live the Emperor, long live I-47, he shouted. This moved me very much, and I shouted, Ensign Watanabe, Banzai. The time was 4.25am. Lieutenant Fukuda was the last to go. His chiton had been having trouble with its steering apparatus. Can you steer all right? I asked over the telephone. It seems satisfactory, Captain, he replied. I am ready to go, good, I said. The other three torpedoes are running smoothly. 
There are lots of targets. Take your time and attack the best target you can find. Do you have any final words? No sound came from him. I thought the telephone line might have parted, but it had not. Fukuda was simply speechless then, just after his engine started, and just before his telephone line parted, Fukuda cried Banzai. It came over the telephone so loudly that all in the conning tower could hear it. All four chitin were gone, four men seeking out targets more than thousand times as big as their weapons. Releasing them made I-47 lighter. She bobbed gently to the surface, less than three miles from the nearest enemy ship. Fortunately, darkness covered us. I swung about on a southeasterly course and made away at twenty knots. Although Nishina had pleaded me to concentrate solely on escaping, I intended to stay near enough to note results. The chitin were due to reach their targets shortly before 5am. I wanted to be on the surface holding binoculars, not underwater looking through a night periscope, when they struck. Time ticked by. Five o'clock, Captain, the signal's petty officer told me as I stood on the bridge, peering out over the stern. More time went by, until the signal's petty officer, after Lookout and I, all shouted simultaneously there. A great reddish-orange light flared like a lightning burst in the centre of the American anchorage. Then a column of fire shot up from the water's surface, quickly developing into a large fire. A direct hit, the signal's petty officer shouted down into the submarine. I could hear crewmen shouting and cheering below me. The time was 5.7am. At 5.11am, there was another flash, another flame, and another column of fire. Second hit, the signalman shouted to my crew. It was almost daybreak then, but I wanted to wait a little longer. I felt that I owed it to the men who had worked so hard at Kure and Otsujima to take news of a third hit back to them. This was prevented when one of the lookouts shouted a warning. Destroyers, Captain Wright, five degrees, range, two miles approaching, emergency dive. I ordered all eight of us on the bridge got below swiftly. Take her down to 170 feet, I called out, down angle, 15 degrees. In a submarine, this can sometimes make you feel as though you are plunging vertically. All hands clung to whatever they could as I-47 plummeted. When nearly 30 minutes passed without any depth charges coming down, I went up to periscope depth. The destroyer was far away, between us and Ulithi, apparently heading inside the lagoon to investigate the explosions. We were out of danger, at least temporarily. Then, at 5.52am, we felt a mild shock. Small explosion inside the lagoon, said my sound operator. I peered through the periscope and made a quick sketch of what I could see, to be filled in later. At 6am, I ordered all hands to maintain silence and spend a minute in prayer for our departed comrades. Then I swung I-47 north, making for the Leyte area. I-36, meanwhile, had also safely approached Ulithi. Captain Kiyotake Ageta was using her as flagship for the Kikusui mission. Commander Iwao Teramoto had made his preliminary scouting, as I had, then moved into attack position, dodging prowling aircraft several times just before they might have sighted him. When I-36 surfaced, Ensign Imanishi and Ensign Kudo boarded their chitin. Hours later, at 3am, Lieutenant Yoshimoto and Lieutenant Toyozumi crawled into the others via access tubes. Teramoto had his submarine 9.5 miles from Mass Island, which marks the right-hand side of Mugai Channel at 4am. At that time, he discovered that Chitin 1, 2 and 4 had jammed in their racks and could not be fired. In his later report, Commander Teramoto wrote Lieutenant Yoshimoto and Lieutenant Toyozumi could not be fired, so I had to call them back into the submarine. I sent Ensign Imanishi away in number 3, but something went wrong with his telephone connection at the last moment. I have no idea what his final words were. He was launched at 4.54am. The fourth chitin gave Teramoto trouble too. He had to surface and take Ensign Kudo back into the hull. Then he dived and listened for explosions. His sound equipment picked up one at 5.45am and another at 6.5am. Both appeared to be south of Mog Mog Island, which would place them in the northern section of the lagoon. I-36 then had to spend all day submerged. While sound men picked up the noises of more than 100 depth charge and bomb explosions, none of them near the submarine. At 11.40pm, his batteries nearly exhausted, Teramoto had to chance surfacing. In spite of a tight enemy watch, he was able to recharge batteries and get away on the surface. 
Like myself, he headed for the Leyte area, where both submarines were to operate with our conventional torpedoes against enemy shipping. I made my report by wireless to Kure on November 22nd. It was quite a long one. I-36 sent hers early on November 23rd. On November 24th, our orders to Leyte were cancelled and we were summoned home. After a stop at Otsujima, we made Kura on November 30th. Two days later, a meeting was held at 10am on board Tsukushi Maru to evaluate the Kikusui mission. There was much argument over whether the operation should be kept secret or announced. I was in favour of the latter, although I knew Nishina had not been, and I argued for my point of view. The enemy knows about it, I am sure, I said. What value is there in keeping it secret? By getting the feat announced, I hoped to see the tactic of attacking anchorages discarded. Besides air and sea patrols, there were nets and reefs barring the way to Khaiten. I knew that the staff members of Sixth Fleet and the submarine school instructors were ardent advocates of attacking enemy supply lines, so I hoped they would support my argument. They didn't. I was argued down even before the formal portion of the meeting commenced. More than 200 persons were present at this conference, including some from Tokyo, Sixth Fleet staff, submarine school instructors and students, plus officers from the Kure Naval Arsenal. Commander Shojiro Yura explained the original operational plan. Then Teramoto and I told of the actual mission. A study and discussion period followed, after which Lieutenant Commander Bunichi Sakamoto, 6th Fleet Communications Staff Officer, summed everything up. Based on the two columns of fire I had seen, the two large explosions heard by I-36, the plan of each Khitan pilot launched, periscope observations, and comparison of aerial photos taken before and after the attack. Nishina was credited with an aircraft carrier, as were Fukuda and Imanishi. Sato and Watanabe were each credited with a battleship. Americans' reports differ greatly from the conclusions reached at that conference. They say that one Khitan blew up the fleet tanker USS Mississinewa. That ship was carrying 405,000 gallons of aviation gasoline, plus nearly 100,000 barrels of diesel and heavy oil. A chiton near USS Pennsylvania is supposed to have been rammed and sunk. A third near the cruiser USS Mobile was depth-charged and sunk, and another downed by Marine Corps aircraft. A fifth chiton, according to one version, was found wrecked on a reef. Whether accurate or not, the American version had no effect on Japanese thinking or planning, but I still did not like the tactic of attacking anchorages. After the conference, I took Lieutenant Commander Itakura aside and told him I hoped something could be done about training pilots for attacks in the open sea, where submarines had a better chance of launching Khitan without being detected. A few days later, I accompanied Captain Agueta to Tokyo, where he made a full report to the Naval General Staff. On December 12th, he had a personal audience with the Emperor to tell him about the mission. At that time, Agata presented our ruler with the pencil portrait done by Chief Petty Officer Oka. On the day I-47 left Japan on the Kikusui mission, I-372 was completed. She was originally designed to carry no armament at all, but ended up with a 140mm deck gun forward and 225mm disappearing type machine guns aft. I-372 and her two sister boats also mounted one landing craft each, and could carry a total of 110 tonnes of cargo, 10 tonnes of it on deck. Although intended for transport duty, these three submarines were converted to chitin work instead, despite their dragging 13-knot cruising speed. All guns were removed. Three days after I left, the aircraft carrier Shinano was completed. Constructed on a giant hull like those of battleships Yamato and Musashi, largest ships of their type ever built by any nation, Shinano was completed as a carrier to help restore some of our lost naval air power. Shinano was 861 feet long, displaced 72,000 tonnes, and could carry 87 aircraft. An American submarine got Shinano just 17 hours after she left Yokosuka shipyard for the inland sea. Workmen were still on board her, finishing up, when USS Archerfish put four torpedoes into her. She sank at 10.56am, taking down 500 of the 1,500 sailors and workers on board. RO-56, last of the RO-35 class, was completed on November 15th.
This type of submarine was much favoured by Japanese captains. In 1935 and 1937, the Row 33 and Row 35 were built as experimental boats for rapid expansion of our forces in case of war. The pair proved highly manoeuvrable and seaworthy, so 80 improved versions titled the Row 35 class were authorised. Only 18 were actually built, RO35 through RO50, plus RO55 and RO56. They were 280 feet long and could make 19.7 knots on the surface, 8 submerged. Range was 5,000 miles at 16 knots or 11,000 miles at 12. Underwater endurance was 45 hours at 5 knots, RO35 class subs mounted four bow torpedo tubes and, although not originally designed to have a deck gun, mounted a high-angle 80mm gun forward plus a twin 25mm on the after end of the conning tower. All but one of these boats, Row 55, were lost in the war. Three other submarines that are part of an unusual story were completed before I next launched Chiton at the enemy. They were I-13, I-400 and I-401, I-13 was supposed to be of the I-9 class, but when work lagged on the giant I-400 boats, this and one other plane-carrying submarine, I-14, were enlarged and modified. They were given the designation Kaiko Modified Type A and displaced 3,604 tonnes when completed. Surface speed was 16.7 knots, range was 21,000 miles at 16 knots. The hangar was expanded on these so that each could carry two aircraft instead of one, and the supply of 18 torpedoes for the six bow tubes was reduced to 12, so that aerial bombs and aerial torpedoes could be carried. Special blisters were added along the sides of the hull to provide stability for the added displacement. A 140mm deck gun aft, plus two triple and one single 25mm machine gun mounts rounded out I-13's armament. I-13 was completed on December 16, 1944, I-400 was finished two weeks later, and I-400 won nine days after that. Only five of the proposed 18 boats of the I-400 class were laid down. They were Sentoku Special Submarines, intended for the bombing of Washington and New York, but that ambitious plan was discarded. The new intention was to send the monster boats at the Panama Canal, so they could destroy its locks and shut off the flow of ships that seemed to increase the enemy's Pacific fleet almost daily. Final size of the I-400 class boats was 403 feet in length. They displaced 5,222 tonnes on the surface. Range was 37,500 miles at 14 knots. An interesting feature of this class of boats was that each had two hulls, the spectacle shape helping to provide stability while maintaining a low silhouette on the surface. Going aft from bow, one encountered a catapult track 86 feet long, then a massive hangar 100 feet long. On these boats, as well as on I-13 and I-14, the conning tower was mounted out of the way to port, so room could be made for aircraft stowage along the centreline. The underwater aircraft carrier construction programme had been pushed forward as rapidly as possible, but it would be months before a squadron could be made up. Meanwhile, my I-47 was refitted and replenished at Kure, and I started training more Khitan men at Otsujima. Before long, a second mission of human torpedoes was ordered. It was to be called Kongo. Kongo in Japanese means steel. In the Buddhist religion, it also signifies great strength or power. In addition, it is the name of a mountain in the Kawachi district, south of Nara, where the Kusunoki family lived. Masashige Kusunoki trained his army near Kongoyama, elated over the success at Ulithi. Sixth Fleet planners ignored the loss of I-37. A second, heavier strike was planned, with six boats ordered out on it, I-36, I-47, I-48, I-53, I-56 and I-58. All of the other captains but one Teramoto of I-36 had been classmates of mine at Etajima, we were to carry a total of 24 Khitan into battle. Lieutenant Commander Masahiko Morinaga commanded Row 34 and I-5 before taking over I-56. He scored well with her in the Philippines, originally a destroyer man. Morinaga entered the submarine service in 1940 and quickly mastered the tasks and skills necessary to becoming an excellent submariner. 
Morinaga's target was to be Manus Island in the Admiralties. It was an excellent anchorage and a place where the Americans astounded Australian allies with their ability to fit out a base rapidly after its capture. Lieutenant Commander Seihachi Toyomasu, the principal of a high school in northern Kyushu after the war, had I-53. At Etajima, we had always called him Sister Gandhi because his utterances were so like those of the great Indian leader. And like Gandhi, Toyomasu was a mild man, but absolutely without fear. His target area was Kossel Strait. I-48 and I-58 had just completed shakedown training. Lieutenant Commander Zenshin Toyama had I-48. He was from Okinawa and had been a top scholar at Etajima. He had also excelled in sumo, swimming and judo. Our common love of sports mine, being chiefly football and rowing, had made a bond between Toyama and me in those early days, and we became fast friends. Toyama's target in the Congo mission was to be Ulithi, and I feared greatly for him, since he would be going up against Americans who were now alerted. Lieutenant Commander Moskitsura Hashimoto had I-58. He took command of her after leaving a boat with a confusing hull number, I-158. I-158 was an obsolete boat in which Hashimoto carried out experiments in communication. Now and then, one reads of low-frequency underwater transmissions being used in submarine work. Hashimoto, who, after the war, directed the building of submarines for Japan's Maritime Self-Defence Force at Kawasaki Heavy Industries, Kobe, may be considered one of the pioneers in this field. While operating submerged off Beppu in early 1944, he sent a message that was picked up at Nagoya, 600 miles away, having travelled through water all that distance. Hashimoto's Kaiten assignment was Apra Harbour, Guam, another location of much enemy shipping. The only skipper on the Congo mission who had not been a midshipman with our class at Etajima was Commander Iwao Teramoto of I-36. He was to attack Ulithi a second time. The attack dates for all boats, with the exception of I-48, was to be January 11th, 1945. Toyama was not to attack until ten days after Teramoto did. As for myself, my destination was to be Hollandia, New Guinea, where heavy concentrations of enemy ships were constantly being reported. My Kaiten pilots were Lieutenant Teruo Kawakubo, Lieutenant Toshiro Hara, Petty Officer Minoru Muramatsu, and Petty Officer Katsumi Sato. The latter had been aviation trainees. Kawakubo led the four-man group, and he was very dear to me, not only because he was an Etajima graduate, but because his older brother, Nautada, had been in my Buntai squad at Etajima. As I explained earlier, ten men from each yearly class were organised into vertical composite groups for athletic competition. Nautada Kawakubo, Toshitada Tokutomi, who died as CO of RO61 in the Aleutians, Tadayoshi Miyake killed early in the war on board a minesweeper off Sumatra, and I had led our squad to many athletic victories. Nautada went into naval aviation upon graduation and was killed in June 1936 while in combat over Amoy, China. Now I was taking his younger brother out to meet death in combat. I-56 departed Otsujima for Manus on December 21st. I took I-47 out on Christmas Day. Three more submarines followed us out on December 30th, and Toyama took I-48 to sea on January 1st for the Ulithi follow-up attack. Of our total of 24 Kaiten, only 18 were fired. Lieutenant Commander Morinaga got close to Manus all right, but not close enough. Mr Harrington, who has been to Manus, tells me that ships moor a great distance in from the channel's entrance. Morinaga found this entrance completely blocked by welly laid anti-submarine nets. He tried again and again to get past them without success. At one time he became stuck fast in the nets and had much difficulty getting free. Finally, he had to give up and head for home with his chiton that left twenty others that could be used. Hashimoto moved in on Guam. He fired his four chiton from a point eleven miles off Apra and observed columns of smoke later. Teramoto managed to get I-36 undetected in close to Ulithi for the second time, and this time all of his chiton were operative. But I-53 had poor luck. Toyomasu got in past the screening patrols around Kossel Strait, but one of his chiton was unable to get its motor started. He fired another, but it mysteriously exploded almost immediately after launching, giving the submarine a monstrous jar. 
The pilot of that torpedo, Lieutenant Hiroshi Kazumi, must have accidentally hit the special detonator switch in the operator's compartment. Captain Toyomasu got the other pair of chiton away without incident. My old friend Toyama must have made his attack successfully. American writings tell of a giant torpedo exploding near the ammunition ship USS Mazama on January 20th, but they tell of no similar occurrences at Ulithi on that date. And on the following day, I-48 was sighted. Apparently Toyama had hoped that his attack on Ulithi, following two others, might panic some large ships into sortieing so he could pick them off as they passed by. So he remained in the general area. In the evening of January 21st, an aircraft reported his presence. Three destroyer escorts, USS Conklin, USS Raby and USS Corbezier, were sent to hunt for the submarine. Early in the morning of January 23rd, his batteries exhausted, Toyama was forced to come up to the surface to recharge. The ever-ready radar pinpointed him, and I-48 was sunk before noon. As for I-47, we were lucky again. My crewmen attributed this to a good omen. The rescue we made just five days out of the inland sea on December 30th. I-47 was on the surface, and I was just about to give a diving order when one of my lookouts shouted, Raft. We approached and found on board it an ensign, chief petty officer, and six seamen of the Imperial Navy, all nearly dead. They had the strangest story to tell, although communiques out of Tokyo had stated that all our remaining men on Guam had been annihilated while making one last glorious Banzai attack. These men said that some 4,000 to 5,000 men were still alive in the island's southern section. We were ordered to go around the enemy lines, they said, and make a toko attack on installations and aircraft. We made a raft of empty fuel drums and set out on November 28th, but the current and wind were against us. We were gradually borne far out to sea. The eight men had been adrift for 32 days in the open ocean when we found them. They had subsisted on seagulls shot with their rifles and on fish caught with handmade hooks. Their only water came from sporadic rain squalls which occurred daily in that part of the Pacific. When we called out in Japanese to them, they could barely wave. All eight thought their rescue was a miracle, as did our Khitan pilots. Those men have been saved to take our places in this life, said Khitan pilot Kawakubo. He and his men showered the remains of their personal possessions on the survivors. They need them, the Khitan men said. In a few days we will not. My crewmen caught this spirit of the miracle, and morale soared higher than it had ever been. The trip continued without incident, only one aircraft being sighted. That was on January 1st, the great holiday of Japan. I was on the bridge meditating when a lookout called aircraft. His shout interrupted a silent prayer I was saying for the four Khitan men I had launched at Ulithi six weeks before. We got I-47 submerged within 40 seconds, and I congratulated the crew on their performance. The plane had not noticed us for no bombs or depth charges followed us down. On January 4th, we received wireless orders changing our attack date to January 12th. It gave us an extra day, so I took advantage of that to slow down the boat and let the crew hold an equator-crossing celebration. Our leading quartermaster, who had crossed the line 32 times in his naval career, was made god of the equator with red and white mokultsuki, rice cakes offered him as tribute by his subjects. At midnight of January 10th, 1945, I was 50 miles north of Humboldt Bay, Hollandia, New Guinea. Three days earlier, a wireless report had said that 50 enemy ships, including cruisers, destroyers, cargo ships and tankers, were anchored there. It was the rainy season in New Guinea, the sky and the sea were black. Everything that moved in the water gave off a luminous glow. I-47 had to go ahead with care, keeping our wake to a minimum. By 2 a.m. I could see a glow in the sky ahead, like the one that had shone over Ulithi. Shortly after that, in a rain squall off to port, I could see a light blinking. Was it gunfire or a searchlight? I couldn't tell. We were now inside the enemy's offshore patrol area. I swung I-47 to starboard, presenting the smallest silhouette possible, just in case a ship was in that squall ready to open fire. The lights were repeated. Stop engines, I ordered. If I dared run away or try to submerge, it would only arouse suspicion. Blink all navigation lights, I called out. This was done. 
and what turned out to be an enemy patrol boat steamed away. My ruse worked. Had I dived, he would have gotten I-47 on his sonar in an instant. My lookouts were doubly watchful after that. Before dawn of the 11th, I submerged. At 1am, I was three miles off the peculiarly shaped mouth of Humboldt Bay, the green Stanley Range clear in my periscope. We gave Cape Soyadia the nickname of Cape Congo after our mission. There was one LST in sight to the left, and two small ships patrolling nearby, so I dared not let the top of my periscope get more than 30 inches above the surface. I summoned the four Khitan pilots to the conning tower, and let each take a look. All you have to do, I said, is go around that cape and turn right. You will then have your choice among 50 targets. After about 20 minutes, I turned I-47 around and made for the open sea. It was time to make final preparations for the attack. That afternoon, my officers and I invited the Khitan pilots to a departure ceremony. A special tea was served, prepared in the ceremonial Japanese manner. Such tea is thick and bitter, so we served the traditional yokan sweet bean pastry to harmonise with it. The atmosphere of our gathering was quiet, almost serene, although the conversation was more animated than one might expect on such a solemn occasion. The eldest of the Khitan men was only 23 years old, and I marvelled, as I have before and since, at how such fine, strong young persons could maintain the calm cheerfulness they did in those last days and hours of their lives. One hour after sunset, I took I-47 to the surface and headed back toward Humboldt Bay at nine knots. The sea was flat and glassy. I felt sure that none of the other submarines was encountering conditions so ideal for Khitan operations. Hollandia still threw a glow into the sky, I noted. At 1am, I called all pilots to the conning tower. We will be four and one half miles north of Cape Congo by 4am, I said. We have a dead calm sea, and there is no evidence that the enemy is suspicious. Lieutenant Kawakubo will be launched at 4.15am, then Muramatsu, Sato and Hara at five-minute intervals. You will steer a course of 180 degrees until you have the tip of Cape Congo abeam to starboard. After that, you are on your own. Select the best possible target. Try to make your attacks simultaneously, keeping to the time schedule if possible. I wish you success, all four repeated my instructions. Then Muramatsu and Sato went out on deck and climbed into their weapons. Kawakubo and Hara entered theirs through the access tubes at 2.30am. For many years afterward I could recall vividly how they looked, all wearing short-sleeved khaki shirts and khaki shorts. All wore white hachimaki about their heads, bearing the kanji ideographs Shichi Shoho Koku. In past ages, Samurai warriors wore white headbands to keep sweat from their eyes during battles or duels. Schoolchildren wear them in Japan these days, on athletic field days, as do union workers when conducting a strike. Hachimaki are considered the mark of great striving, great determination. Translated into English, the kanji writings meant seven lives to serve country, and their meaning in Japanese is born seven times to serve the homeland. Americans might understand this hundreds of years old saying who remember what their Revolutionary War patriot Nathan Hale said just before he died. We were still a few miles short of the launch point when the sonar buzzer sounded in the conning tower. Screw sounds were reported. I raised the periscope and took a look. There, about five miles away in the mist, was a large ship. Stand by to load the forward torpedo tubes, I called out and ordered all hands to battle stations, submerged. I planned to send our four chitin away on their mission, then attack this ship with torpedoes. But as I kept watching her, I saw that she had all her lights on. I could soon make out a giant red cross painted on her side. Hospital ship, I told my crew, and ordered all torpedo preparations halted. The men were disappointed at being cheated of their target. And so was I. At 4 a.m., I ordered the pilots to stand by for launching. They checked compass settings and depth gauges, then opened the pressurised oxygen valves and fuel cocks in their weapons. At my order, crewmen would release the final tie-down as the pilot reached behind him and pushed a starting lever. Seconds after that, he would move out and face eternity. At 4.10 a.m., as a tribute to those four brave lads, I ordered all of my officers and men to join me in singing Gunkan Kai Gun, the Imperial Navy's marching song, 
the Japanese counterpart of Anchors Away. The chitin pilots, telephone mouthpieces pressed to their lips, sang along. Some of my crewmen dissolved in tears and could not finish the song. At 4.15am I asked Kawakubo if he was ready. Ready, Captain, he answered in a clear, ringing voice. Good luck to all in I-47 then. Calmly he added goodbye. His weapon moved away smoothly, as did the other three in their turns. As soon as the fourth one was gone, I trimmed ship, put about, surfaced, and headed north at full speed. The hospital ship we had to pass was very near, moving in the opposite direction. I could have sunk her easily. Later I was to receive a severe tongue-lashing from a high-ranking officer for not attacking that hospital ship. He would chide me almost hysterically. Why didn't you sink it? Less than two months later, an American submarine sank our hospital ship AWA MAM in the China Sea, didn't it? My answer was that I had as much fighting spirit as anyone, but I just could not bring myself to torpedo a hospital ship at the same time I committed four fine young men to death. Such are the quirks of a man's mind. Perhaps I might have attacked that hospital ship if I had met her before I became a Khitan submarine captain. Or maybe I would have attacked in the final, desperate months of the war. I truly cannot say, but if I had, one thing is certain, I would not be telling this story. I would have been hanged or shot by the International Military Tribunal after the war. The same morning mist that had shrouded that hospital ship now hung over the shoreline, obscuring visibility, when my watch showed 5am, the time appointed for simultaneous attack. I waited anxiously for explosions. I was still waiting at 5, 5am and at 5.10am. Then, at 5.11am, a yellowish-red flash of enormous size tore away some of the mist over the enemy anchorage. I watched for more, but my radio man shouted up through the conning tower that he was intercepting an enemy plain-language submarine warning message. At least it sounded to him like that, he said. It was from Commander Naval Base Hollandia to all Allied ships SS SSS. I agreed with the radio man and dived the boat at once. There was no trouble during our escape. We were back at Curie on February 1st. Another evaluation conference was held, the 6th Fleet staff members determined that 18 ships had been sunk for the 18 Khitan expended. This made a total of 23 ships, including four aircraft carriers and two battleships according to them, at the cost of two submarines I-37 and I-48 in two missions. Many present were elated over this, but I was not. I-56 had been turned back, and both I-57 and I-48 had been sunk, probably close to their targets. Then, too, there was that plain-language submarine warning. Hollandia suspected submarine presence, no doubt of it. And, too, I had been sighted on the way in by that patrol vessel. Anchorage attacks were bound to become more difficult to make, perhaps even impossible. I pressed for a change in policy, for a chance to make chitin attacks in the open sea, where odds against us were not so great. So did some of the other submarine captains, and this new policy was given tentative approval, but it would be changed and rechanged later. High officials in the Japanese government tried to keep a bright face on things, despite the war's worsening. And the weather worked for us on December 18th, when a typhoon struck the US fleet east of the Philippines and sank three destroyers and damaged 20 other ships, including seven aircraft carriers. But US Army planes from the Marianas began hitting Tokyo three weeks before that. People at home were beginning to worry, I could tell that Hisako was concerned, although she tried to hide it from me like a good Navy wife. I never told her anything of my missions. Each morning she and our son would bid me farewell at the door of our house. Each evening they would greet me on my return. When there was a mission starting, I would leave as I did on any other day, giving no sign that anything special was to happen. When I did not get home for several days, she knew that I was at sea and would wait patiently until a communications aide from the Cura naval base would come to the house and tell her that I-47 was heading up the channel. Then she would show her joy and relief by cooking very special meals and being more than usually kindly toward me. I am sure that nothing totally reassured her but my short figure striding up the path to our house, not even the Emperor's address to the National Diet on its December 26th opening. The war situation is growing more critical, he told our legislators, but our army and navy are destroying the enemy wherever he is met. The Americans took the Philippine island of Mindoro as a jumping-off place for their thrust at Manila in mid-December. 
Resistance on Leyte was almost completely wiped out a few days after that. American cruisers and destroyers were shelling Iwo Jima regularly when I headed for Hollandia, and in 1944, total number of merchant ships sunk by Japanese submarines was a dismal sum. Only 58 enemy ships were sunk in the areas where Japanese submarines were operating, many of them by German U-boats covering the Cape of Good Hope. Only eight of the ships were sunk in the Pacific. As a matter of fact, in 1944, Japanese submarines actually sank fewer enemy ships than the number of submarines we lost. Our underwater fleet, once ranked with the world's finest, had deteriorated into a toko weapon, flung at the enemy with no hope of victory, only an outside chance of slowing him down. The Americans landed at Lingayen Gulf, Luzon, in the northern Philippines, on January 9th, then started their sweep down the Luzon Plain into Manila, the same route taken by the Imperial Army in its successful invasion three years earlier. We had not one I-boat left in the area with which to attack their amphibious forces. I-8 and I-165 were in the Indian Ocean. I-12 had been lost somewhere in the enemy's rear area. This submarine left Cure on October 4th for a solitary patrol in the eastern Pacific. A very fanciful report claims that two American ships sank one of our submarines there on November 13th, but I am afraid that all that they got for their effort was a whale. I-12 sank the American SS John A. Johnson, northeast of Oahu, and continued to cruise until after the end of the year. She was commanded by Commander Kaneo Kudo, a very gentle man, extremely thoughtful of others who appreciated life's finer things. His boat was last heard from on January 5th, 1945, so she was either lost operationally or to a ship or plane that never got credit for the sinking. Long after the war, I learned of an incident that took place in the last days of 1944. It concerned a large training ship, a four-masted sailing vessel which was running supplies between New Zealand and San Francisco. The crew was surprised one day when a Japanese submarine suddenly surfaced, almost alongside. Its gun crew poured out of the conning tower and in seconds trained their weapon on this relic of earlier days. The submarine slowly cruised in a circle around the sailing vessel, whose crew fully expected to be blown out of the water at any moment. Then suddenly the deck crew abandoned their gun and went below. A blinker light on the submarine's bridge flashed out. A very beautiful ship. Good luck on your voyage. Then the submarine dived and was not seen by the sailing ship crew again. I-12 was the only submarine we had within thousands of miles of that spot at that time, and knowing Commander Kudo, I am sure that he could not bear to blast such a beautiful ship into the sea. So he let her go on her way unmolested. All that Admiral Miwa had available to send against the enemy in the northern Philippines were his medium RO-type submarines. Of those he sent down, four were lost. Lieutenant Commander Teruo Sugayoshi brought RO-49 back safely, claiming damage to an Idaho-class battleship, while Lieutenant Masahiko Tokunaga claimed he sank two cargo ships with RO-46. RO-50 claimed hits on an aircraft carrier, a cruiser and a destroyer. The Americans admitted only damage to the transport USS Cavalier, the loss of destroyer Renshaw, and the loss of an LST that had to be sunk by her own forces after suffering heavy damage from a submarine's torpedo. Whatever we did accomplish in this sortie, it cost Japan four boats. Row 115 was the first to go down. Lieutenant Chuzo Chikuma's boat was summoned from the Indian Ocean and sent into the Philippines. She departed Singapore on January 22nd and ran into the screen of a US task force west of Mindoro ten days later. Destroyers Bell, O'Bannon and Jenkins, plus the destroyer escort Moore, teamed up to sink her. Row 55 was lost on February 7th. Lieutenant Commander Koichiro Sua and his crew were not long out of a shakedown training when they left Kure on January 27th. The last word received from Sua was on February 2nd. Five days after that, west of Manila, he tried to attack a convoy of ships heading for Leyte Gulf. The destroyer escort Thomason picked him up on radar and sank his ship. The other two submarines lost in this counterattack were trying to carry out evacuation missions. Admiral Halsey's pilots had been so terribly effective in sweeping our Philippines airfields clear of planes that we had a great number of airmen grounded, their planes destroyed in the archipelago. 
As in other places, submarines were sent to return them to Japan. At the end of January, four submarines were ordered to northern Luzon for this work. Row 46 was the only submarine that successfully brought passengers home. Row 112 and Row 113, the second of which had been pulled in from the Indian Ocean, were at Takao, Formosa, taking aboard fuel and supplies. They departed there on February 9th and ran into the prowling American submarine Batfish. Lieutenant Toru Yuchi was taking Row 112 to Apari and was just entering Babuyan Channel when another technique new to us was used against him, radar-controlled torpedo fire. This shows how far ahead of us in equipment development American boats were. USS Batfish had radar so dependable she could use its ranges and bearings in solving the ballistic problem associated with firing of torpedoes. While the radars on our submarines, even at the end of the war, were so primitive that they might be referred to in American slang as the Model T brand. Row 112 went down on the night of January 11th, and Lieutenant Kiyoshi Harada, who was trailing behind in Row 113, lost his ship and his life to Batfish a little more than 24 hours later. USS Batfish claims to have sunk a third submarine before getting those two, but I think American crewmen interpreted a premature explosion as a hit. We lost no other boats in that area at that time. To shrivel our forces more, we lost two transport submarines in January. The first was I-562, which left Yokosuka for Walei on January 1st. She was due at her station, midway between Truk and Palau, on January 21st. Lieutenant Commander Ainosuke Nakashima had already made successful supply runs to Wake Island and Marcus Island, but his luck ran out. He was picked up on the radar of the destroyer escort USS Fleming in the darkness of January 18th and sunk. I-371, as I have already mentioned, was lost to USS Legato, a submarine, off Bungo Strait, on the way home from a successful supply run to Walai. By the middle of February 1945, the 6th Fleet was down to a total of seven RO boats, including the new RO-56 and six I-boat Khitan carriers. Half of our Indian Ocean Force had been lost in the Philippines, so I-8 and I-165 were called home. I-351 was completed, but had to be put into use as an underwater tanker, so critical was the shortage of fuel in Japan at the time. The situation seemed hopeless, our problems insurmountable, then, to make things worse, the American Marines landed on Iwo Jima on February 19th. In September 1944, the Imperial Navy officially formed a submarine unit with the designation Toko Squadron 1, based on Urazaki, about seven miles southeast of Kure in the Inland Sea. Rear Admiral Mitsuru Nagai headed this first suicide organisation of World War II, which was in existence more than a month before Vice Admiral Takejiro Inishi formed kamikaze units in the Philippines. Nagai had three staff officers, one of whom was Lieutenant Commander Mitsuma Itakura, who served as torpedoes and operations officer, as well as commanding officer of the base. Urazaki was base for Kuryu, midget submarines, which were ordered produced in great numbers, while Otsujima, Hikari and Hirao, all not very far away, were for the training of Khitan pilots. In February 1945, Toko Squadron 2 formed, with Rear Admiral Noboru Owada commanding. There seemed at that time no way to stop the enemy short of the homeland's shores, so preparations were made to smash him when he did try to invade Japan itself. A great number of Khitan, Koryu and Shinyo high-speed smallcraft, together with torpedo boats, were scattered at hidden places all along our coastline. They had orders to train and keep developing their proficiency until the enemy was actually in sight of Japan. Then, one great assault would be made on the enemy fleet. The Shinyo, of which thousands were produced, were light plywood boats that could carry either two depth charges or an explosive charge in the bow. The method for using depth charges which some Shinyo employed in the Philippines was to run close to an enemy ship in the darkness, push over depth charges set to detonate at a very shallow setting, then race away. The exploding depth charges would blast in the side of a ship if dropped close enough to it. With a charge set in the bow, of course, Shinyo could act like Khitan, ramming into a ship, then exploding. 
The eastern and southern shores of Kyushu, the island where the enemy would most likely make his first landing, were dotted with clusters of these weapons. More were located along Key Strait just south of Osaka, in Ise Bay, south of Nagoya, and along the shores of Sagami Bay, into which Tokyo Bay flows before reaching the Pacific Ocean. We also had them on the eastern shore of Chiba Peninsula near Tokyo, the east coast of northern Honshu, and on Hokkaido, our northernmost main island. After the war, we learned that the Allies did indeed plan to land on Kyushu and follow up with a landing at Chiba. I-361 made a supply run to Wake Island in January, and right after that was rigged for Caton work. The same was done with I-363 after it made a run to Walai and two runs to Marcus Island. Caton racks were also fitted to I-366 and I-367, after each had made a pair of successful supply runs. I-368 and I-370, although designed as supply and transport submarines, were completed as chitin carriers. The new Hay-101 class of submarines was to replace these larger boats in the transport effort. Plans had been approved for building 100 of the Hay-101 boats, but only 12 were actually laid down. They were only 147 feet long, and displaced 429 tonnes. They made ten knots on the surface, five submerged. All had a cruising range of only 3,000 miles, but that was considered sufficient for the work they were to do. Each could carry 60 tonnes of cargo, and had a single 25mm machine gun on the bridge for armament. None had torpedo tubes. In the Japanese phonetic alphabet, Wine and RO are the first and second characters, and HA is the third, so these hay-type boats were our Class C ones. On January 29, 1945, the beginning was made on another Class C type of submarine. That was the day Hay 201 was laid down at Sasebo. Nearly 100 of these were planned, but only 37 hulls were laid down, of which 10 were completed. Had they been ready earlier in the war, they might have been a very effective weapon for Japan. Part of our new emphasis on small ship construction the Hay 201 class subs were only 175 feet long and displaced but 377 tons. They could make 13 knots either surfaced or submerged, and their designed range of 3,000 miles turned out to be 5,000. They were called Sen Shou, submarine, small and carried four torpedoes for firing through two bow tubes. Deck armament was a 7.7mm machine gun on the bridge. Che 201 subs were prefabricated in shops, then assembled on the ways, with electric welding used throughout. Construction time was only 12 weeks, and we hoped to build 14 a month once production got rolling. Crew strength was 22 men, and the boats could dive to 330 feet. We used the I-200 series to number our high-speed submarines. The I-201 class, built after much study of RO-500 given us by the Germans, was a revolutionary type. I-201 herself was completed on February 2nd, 1945. She was a new thing in submarines, completely streamlined. Even her 225mm machine guns on deck were the disappearing type. Called Sentaka, submarine high speed, she had nearly a 12 to 1 length to diameter ratio, which made her very sleek. Displacing 1,291 tonnes, these boats would make 15.8 knots on the surface, once underwater, though, they could make a phenomenal 19 knots. They could maintain this rapid pace for 55 minutes, then continue underwater for 12 more hours at 3 knots, or alternatively they could move underwater for 45 hours at 3 knots. I-201 class boats could dive to 365 feet and carried 10 torpedoes for firing through four forward tubes. Eight of these boats were laid down, but only three were completed all of them at Kura. When Iwo Jima was invaded, the third Khitan sortie was made. This was the Chihaya group, named for Chihaya Joe, the castle where the Kusunoki family lived. Three boats took 14 Khitan to Iwo Jima, I-368, under Lieutenant Commander Mitsuteru Irisawa, mounted five, as did I-370, under Lieutenant Suzumu Fujikawa. Lieutenant Commander Genbei Kawaguchi's I-44 carried four of the human torpedoes. The first two boats left Otsujima one day after the Americans landed on Iwo Jima. 
I-44 followed three days later. I-370 tried to attack a convoy of transports south of Iwo Jima on February 26. The destroyer escort Finnegan picked her up on radar before dawn and sank her. She may have launched Caton before being sunk, because our Iwo Jima garrison reported seeing several tall columns of fire out to sea. I-368 was sunk the following day by planes from USS Anzio, an escort carrier that was the nucleus of a hunter-killer anti-submarine group protecting the American amphibious force. We also lost Row 43 on February 26. Lieutenant Seiki Tsukigata had taken this boat out of Kure on February 16. Five days later, he torpedoed and badly damaged the destroyer Renshaw off Iwo Jima. The enemy ship had to be towed away to safety. Our 043 got away from surface attackers and escaped their onslaughts again a few days later. But on the 26th, a plane from USS Anzio found and sank Tsukigata's boat. As for the third of the Kaiten carries, I-44, she was kept down for nearly 47 hours by ships and airplanes, so tight were the patrols around Iwo Jima. When his crew seemed near exhaustion and suffocation, Lieutenant Commander Kawaguchi decided to break off his mission. He headed for home, this so infuriated Admiral Miwa that the 6th Fleet Commander ordered Kawaguchi relieved immediately upon return to port. An unjust action, surely, but it points up how desperate the situation was and how desperate men had become. Although I-44 would almost certainly have been sunk without doing any damage to the enemy had Kawaguchi pressed on, Miwa still felt that he should have. Other submarine captains, myself included, felt that I-44's captain had done the proper thing. Only four men in that boat had death as their mission, not the entire crew. It is much easier to make decisions in the rear area than at the periscope of a submarine in the battle zone. In battle, all responsibility lies with the captain. His judgment, after all his years of training and experiences, must be trusted. The Americans had planned to land on Formosa and the coast of China, and launch a direct invasion of Japan from there. However, our land forces in China had staged a great offensive and overrun some of the air bases from which the Allies had intended to bomb Japan. So they changed their strategy. After the northern Philippines were secured, then new plan was to take Iwo Jima, then Okinawa, each area captured providing support for the next to be taken. Our planners expected something like this so, toward the end of 1944. Iwo Jima and Okinawa were heavily fortified. The defences were mainly inland rather than at the beaches. The idea was to fight the enemy at his beachhead at first, then to hit him again and again much harder after he had made his way inland. The fourth Kaiten sortie to go out and the second aimed at Iwo Jima was the Shimbu group. Shimbu, freely translated, means the way of God's samurai. Only two submarines made up the Shimbu group, I-36 and I-58. I-36 was commanded by the youngest man to captain a first-line Japanese submarine, Lieutenant Commander Tetsuaki Sugamasa. He was only 29 years old at the time and eight years out of Etajima, from which he was graduated in 1937. Each boat carried four kaiten, my classmate Hashimoto, left in I-58 on March 1st. Sugamasa left two days later, I-36 was called back due to a change in plans, but I-58 continued to the attack. Hashimoto did a remarkable job of getting almost to his launching point, but he was diverted to take station off Okinoshima in order to provide a radio beacon for two-engine Ginga bombers, making a long-range kamikaze strike from Kyushu against B-29 bomber facilities on Saipan. On the night of March 10th, while Hashimoto was still out, Tokyo was firebombed on a raid for which the American air general, Curtis LeMay, did not have official approval or permission. Wave after wave of stripped-down B-29 bombers came in at low level, scattering incendiary bombs. What ensued was what safety officials in Tokyo always have feared most, a firestorm. The fires generated high winds through excessive heat, and these winds swept flames across the city, above the ground and buildings, consuming the oxygen beneath them. Japanese died where they stood or sat, not a mark upon them. They simply perished of suffocation. A similar thing had happened in the Great Kanto earthquake of September 1st, 1923. 
which was followed by firestorms. In that 1945 fire, in one night, more Japanese died than the total in atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Over 125,000 lost their lives, and another one million people were left homeless. This bombing worried me and made it difficult to concentrate on my duties. Hisako was pregnant with our second child and living not far from the base, which American carrier planes hit on March 19th. She tried not to show me her fears and had even made me a Sennin Bari Haramaki to preserve me in danger. Translated literally, this means thousand person stitches stomach wrapper. Wives, mothers and sweethearts gave them to their men in war. Worn wrapped about the waist, they were supposed to give a man the protection of the gods. A woman tried to get 1,000 different persons to sew one stitch apiece into this band, signifying that the hopes and prayers of 1,000 people accompanied it. It was a common sight during the war to see women standing on the street corners for days until enough passers-by had stopped to complete one. To please Hisako, I wore this haramaki together with a small amulet in a brocade sack which she had obtained at a shrine. 